Okay. Hi everyone. So I'm just waiting for my guest to join me. Um, Edgar, and he should be popping up very soon. So if you can just give us a few seconds. And I'm just waiting. But today we're actually going to be doing something a little different compared to what um, I usually cover and and we're just waiting for Edgar to join here as well but oh there we go so I'll tell you now what we're busy with so just give us a second while he joins the call I see. Love. Hi. Hi, Ika. How are you? Sounds a whole lot better. Hey, Lubna, you well? Way better. I'm glad we did this over I, um, as well. Um, and right. I'm glad that we have that background and not the previous <laughs> background. Um, <laughs> that one's a nice trial run, though. Yeah, well, it's good we did it. <laughs> okay, cool. So I see there's already uh, people on the call. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'm doing something a little different this time. Um, as you know, October is Mental Health Awareness Month. And I'm also running a self-care series and part of self-care or holistic care is looking after your mental well-being. And in line with that, um, you know, we'll be discussing what it's like to live with depression. And on the call today, I have a very wonderful and brave guest, Edgar. And he, well, uh, basically, he will be discussing, we will be chatting about what it's like to live with depression. You know, usually, you know, we chat to psychologists and counselors and, you know, um, you know the, and we hear things from their perspective, but not very often we don't actually hear something from a pe- perspective of someone who has gone through that and so um, this is also one of those initiatives as well um, like I, I I think it can I have spoken about this before and um, yeah. and one of the reasons sort of why well why I thought it was quite a important topic to discuss like I think that for, for me specifically I think that there's a lot of stigmas attached to mental health and um, I think it's very important that we encourage people to talk about it and to um, deal with it, you know, in a healthier way. And one way to do that is to sort of bring about awareness. And, and that's sort of one of the reasons why I'm doing this today. And um, so with me, like I said, I've got Edgar. Edgar is um, a employee benefits specialist. He's a part-time MC and radio show host as well, which is quite impressive. Um, and and I, just, I want to also thank Edgar for joining and for being brave to actually talk about this as well. Mm. Um, so, and Edgar, welcome. Thank you very much, Lumna. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, I didn't think I'll ever do this, but yes, I'm, I'm here and I'm ready to roll. Yeah, um, I, I asked you quite a few times, are you sure, we, you, know, we can, we, you know, we can back up, it's fine. And you were like, no, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. So, um, <laughs> I, know you, I know you are um, ready to, to chat. So thank you so much. Thanks for your bravery thank as you. well. Thank you. Okay. So I've mentioned, um, you know, one of the reasons why I think that this is important. Can you perhaps also tell us why why you know why you agreed to chat about this and why why are you talking about it? What sure, one hundred percent. So, so with the little bit that I know about the the illness or the condition, I know that I mean depression is actually a disease in its in itself. It is actually a state of illness. Um, I know that most of the time, or the reality is, it's usually two times women, or it's actually usually more women are prone to the condition depression than the men. But I actually think that 
it is because not a lot of men come out and do talk about it. It is something that is not regarded as manly to come out and talk about, look, I've got this condition and I actually need help. And Mm -hmm. my purpose today is to be able to help someone. If I can reach one person, I know that that one person can reach the next person, you know? So that's really my goal today, to be able to help someone and to remove that stigma that boys don't cry. That's how we were raised. Boys don't cry. But we do cry, actually, Lubna. We do cry. Okay, I cry. <laughs> well, you, you, you are one of those people that admit that they do cry. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, to start somewhere. <laughs> well, well um, and, that, and that's interesting because I was going to ask you, uh, but, I mean, you, why, why else do you think that, um, well, why, why, do, why, is this, why are men told not to cry? And um, why do you think it's so difficult for, for men to come forward when it comes to mental illness? So, so when it comes to not only crying, but crying, I'm using it in its broad terms, right? To sort mm-hmm. of show a sign of weakness in a sense. So you're, mm-hmm. by crying, I'm making myself vulnerable. By talking, mm-hmm. coming onto Instagram live, such as this one, I'm making mm-hmm. myself vulnerable. And mm-hmm. it's something that we are told, or I mean, you're just raised to say that you should not show weakness. You're supposed to be the masculine sort of speech and to look good in front of everybody that you've got everything together, you know? And that is where we actually fall short, in a sense. We really do fall short by not showing our emotion and not coming out to say, look, I actually need help. I'm feeling weak today. I'm not uh, in the best of moods today. But we do then put up a front. And that was me at some point. So, so, so this, you, so from what, I, what you're telling me, there's also societal pressures for men also to be a specific way and to not show mm. weakness or emotion. And then that makes it quite difficult to actually admit that you that you're not okay. So yeah. so so tell me then how tell me a little bit about your journey. Like how did you discover that you mm-hmm. given all of that, all of those social barriers yeah. um, and all the stigmas attached? Like how did you come about finding out? Um, that you were suffering from depression and, and how, did, how, how did that make you feel as a man? Right. So that's a very good question, Lubna. So w- with my journey, it's been probably two and a half to almost three years, right? So firstly, I'm a born again Christian. I, I am involved in the church and you're supposed to uh, show a certain brave face. You're supposed to come up and say, this is who I am and show a good picture every day for everyone that is around you. So I journeyed with that for probably two to three years. I'm also, uh, I work full-time employment. And when you get to the office, you need to be someone who is looked at at a certain pedestal or you're put at a certain pedestal. And you can't be the one that would come, you're, you're looking shabby, your face is looking down, and you're not really sure what's going on. So mm-hmm. every morning I would dress up, and while I'm dressing up, I'm dressing up into character as if I'm going on to a movie set. So I'll get into character. By the time I get into the office, I am in like beast mode, you know? I'm ready to grind, I'm ready to work. And mm-hmm. I would work from from like six to six, six to seven on some days. And Mm -hmm. obviously it will take a toll on your life. It will take a toll on your body. It will take a toll on every single bit that is in you. And Mm -hmm. over those, over the last three years, I did have a few people that I would confide in, a few people that I would talk to. And it became a little bit here and there, a bit difficult to continuing to continue opening up. And by Mm -hmm. so doing, when you open up, you may then find out the people that you're opening up to, that circle is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller because Mm -hmm. they're like, oh man, this dude is coming with the same story again. 
You know, mm. he's coming with the same sob story again. Or, uh, do we really want to listen to that? So it mm. is something I hope we can chat about, uh, about a bit later, about the sort of support mm. structure, the friends that you have around. So mm -hmm. for me, you will, I then took some sort of coping mechanism, which was to isolate myself. So the, the pandemic was not like a big shock to me going into lockdown. And what I mean by that is because I had already, I started isolating myself. I was already covering up myself. So I'm shunning myself from the world because I didn't <laughs> want them to see that other side. So coming into the office, going about my daily business every day, I would do what I do and just do that, get home. And then once you get home, you then hit your reality of the sad life or the loneliness and you then tend to open up to yourself that's when personally i would sit in the empty house and i'm like this is not right so everything will then come falling on you and you don't know how to handle it so this mm -hmm. happened over quite a period of time until it came to a point where i had given up I had given up putting up a face. I was tired of um, not being able to sleep. I would go to bed like half past nine, 10 o'clock. I'm awake at 2 a.m. in the morning. I've got everything and everything running around in my mind, but nothing to do with finding a solution to what I'm going through. So mm -hmm. I would sit from 2 a.m. till about five o'clock. And remember, mm -hmm. I had gotten used to being in the office at six. So it's five mm -hmm. o'clock and I'm like, what's the point of sleeping now? I might as well just get up and go to work. Mm -hmm. So I'll get to work. My eyes are bloodshot red because I'm tired. You know, I'm tired. My brain is tired and my body is tired. But remember, mm -hmm. again, all that I had accustomed myself to doing was to put on the brave face, was to put on uh, the, the makeup to say I'm going on to sit, getting into character. So mm -hmm. until it came on one particular day, I really was just done. I was like, I cannot do this anymore. Uh, if I don't manage to wake up from what I'm about to do now, so be it. Right? But one thing kept bugging in my mind and said no, because I've got two very close buddies of mine, right? So I called the other one. I sent him a message, but he was up to something else, but... Um, he then replied to me later because we were supposed to be meeting in any case on that particular morning. And it's very mm -hmm. unlike of me not to get into a meeting. So I missed that meeting. So that was quite a, a bit of a red flag. I was not answering my calls. I called another friend of mine and I said, look, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. that, was my, that was my cry. That was the first thing that I said. I'm not okay. I need help. So wow. it's, 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 yeah, that was my breaking point to say, I need help. And that's my sort of message to someone today to say, when you find yourself in a bit of a, of a pickle, you don't know what is going on with you. Pick up the mm -hmm. phone, go to someone, talk to someone that you really trust and say, look, I need help. And that person, I really trust them i still do trust them even up until today because that was mm -hmm. the person that said look i'm coming to your house right now just hold mm -hmm. on a little bit longer i'm coming to your house and i'll get you the help that you need and from there mm -hmm. that's another story that we can unpack in a couple of minutes about mm -hmm. how i then was admitted into a clinic uh for for depression and anxiety and stuff so wow so 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 you said it got to the point where you realized that you actually, you can't carry on like this and that yes. you need help. And, and I, I want to actually talk about, because I know that there are different types of depression and there's different levels. And I mean, we're not psychologists, so we won't yeah. necessarily go into that. But I, you mentioned some of the symptoms, the common symptoms of depression. Um, mm. uh, for example, insomnia, not being able to sleep, you know, a feeling right. of sadness, weariness. Mm. Are, are there any other symptoms that was like uh, like telling um, that you know you were going through something and that you needed help? Like what what were those kind of symptoms and, or signs? So, 
So only when I got admitted into clinic did I get to realize that I was showing those symptoms because sometimes when you are in it, you don't mm-hmm. know that that is what is happening to you. So mm-hmm. one sure sign or two or three sure signs for me was the isolation. I'm not that kind of person that that will isolate. I'm an extreme mm-hmm. extrovert. So mm-hmm. I then tended not to enjoy people's company anymore. I stopped enjoying mm-hmm. the things that I like to do, hanging out with people, taking long drives, going on weekends away, or just hanging out with friends, watching a football match, or just having just a chit chat for whatever reason, or going for coffees with friends. I stopped enjoying those things, and I would then lump myself in work and mm-hmm. block out the entire environment around me. So for mm-hmm. me, I then picked up that that is the those were the sure signs of 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 an illness or of a problem that was there, which was the depression. And mm-hmm. you mentioned about about insomnia as well. Uh, it really then catches up with you because you remember you're not sleeping, and mm-hmm. because you're not sleeping, you're not resting. It's a good again mm-hmm. recipe for depression as well because you're not giving yourself. Mm-hmm. You're not giving your body the time to rest and recuperate again. Mm-hmm. So, so, sure. so the 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 show signs or the uh, symptoms of it they vary. They really, really mm-hmm. vary. It's it's it may not be the same, but they use a certain criteria uh, mm-hmm. on like across the board. There is substance abuse. There is alcohol abuse. All of that as well, there is things like genetics that can lead to that, or you could have experienced the trauma event, and then it mm. leads you to that. Mm. So, I mean, um, and, and that's why, I, I mean, I've, we've read in many places, and I've spoken to some psychologists, counselors as well, and they say that, it's, especially now with the pandemic, um, mm. anxiety and depression ha- has, like, increased, like, dramatically now with and, and, and like you said like it can be it can be linked to like trauma and there's a lot of trauma going on at the moment you know where loved ones are getting sick or loved ones passing away people losing jobs and mm. stuff like that and then also like sort of loss so you know like you know, losing people and, and those kinds of things and so it's sort of it makes sense why why you know why that would increase. And I think that one of the reasons why I thought that this would be a valuable discussion is for people that are, that might actually be experiencing similar um, kind of signs, but they, they're not mm-hmm. really aware of, of what's happening to them. So I so. think it's really important. And so you mentioned, you mentioned that you checked into a clinic so tell yeah. me, um, is that the same as a mental facility, or or what is, and what did you do there? So the clinic now, it's 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 really a place um, where you've got access to to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and also OTs or occupational therapist, right? Um, mm-hmm. And. So in my experience, the first day that I got there, I mean, I was at the door, I was checking in and I was going through a form that you sign in and stuff like that. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, what am I doing here, really? Did Mm -hmm. did I make the right decision in coming here? What am I going to be going through while I'm here? Because it was was being checked in for uh, between two to three weeks. So that's like 21 days in that place. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking work that was the first thing that was on my mind i carried my laptop and i'm like i don't well, know you how to I yes i did <laughs> so, <laughs> that was before I saw the... yes they did allow me to they did allow me to bring it in um but i think in the first two days uh or before the first two days lapsed i had realized that i actually don't need to have the laptop in here because the reason why I am in this place is for me to detach myself from at least the world 
and be mm -hmm. able to focus on me. The business can continue on the side and still thrive even when I'm not there, you know? Mm -hmm. And me being in the clinic is for me to become a lot healthier, find myself, fix myself and get better and be a better uh, functioning individual on the outside. So mm -hmm. in that place, the, I can say to you that the beauty of this place is that it's, it's, you are sitting around with like-minded people. You're sitting around with people with more or less similar conditions. So mm -hmm. you, you're like in a safe place. I'm sitting there with someone who also has the same condition as I've got, someone who probably has a worse condition than I've got. And mm -hmm. you don't point a finger at the other. There is like absolute strict confidentiality that is there mm -hmm. in terms of what you talk about and what you discuss. But the most amazing thing there is that no one judges you. There is no judgment on the other. No one looks at you and says, oh, my word, this guy is a drug addict. Oh, this guy wants trying to commit suicide. Things like that. You, know, you don't have that. No one looks at you and says, what are, you, what are you talking about? Which is what you would find on the outside world. If I'm to sit with somebody and tell them that, look, dude, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm going through. They will probably look at you with big eyes like, really, Edgar? Is that you for real? You know? So you are with people that will listen. And that is the most important thing really about if you are dealing with someone who, has, who is going through depression or who has depression or has been diagnosed with that condition, it is to listen and to support. And that's what we got there. That's what I experienced. Someone who would listen, someone who would say, look, um, I'm here for you. I want to hear you. I want to talk to you. I want to help you. This is the reason why I came out to sit with you. And they would really make the time. And it's not about, um, okay, you've got a one-hour consultation, so uh, let's get it quickly going and let it go. But it, there is a follow-up to it. There is a follow-through in terms of your discussions. And we will do some of the things, I mean, at my age, without revealing how old I am, we would have some times, <laughs> we would have times that we would paint, we would do drawings, we would play oh, games yeah. in the afternoon. This is like in, the, in a group therapy session, you know? Mm -hmm. And in the first day, you would think, no, man, I can't be going to arts and crafts at my age. This is something that my son gets to do. And, but you then realize that it is a way to cope with your condition. Remember, when, you, when you've got this disease, when you've got this illness, you need to find something that sort of is a distraction to what you are going through. You need to sort of find a way to help you with, with that condition. So the coloring, I mean, I cannot tell you how soothing it was to sit down and paint a box. I was mm -hmm. like, I haven't done this since kindergarten or since uh, primary school, you know? Mm -hmm. And at my mm -hmm. age, I was doing that. And it is so soothing. You will talk about, um, or you'll have sessions where you will just maybe meditate. And those are skills that they are equipping you with that you are able to use when you get out of the clinic, you know? And when you're out of the clinic now, you're able to, to get around. For me, it actually helped me a lot because for the first time in quite a while, I sort of enjoyed my own company because I went back to the things that I enjoyed doing, that I was enjoyed listening to music. I enjoyed hanging out with friends. I enjoyed going out for long drives. And I started to do that again, you know? And, and, mm -hmm. I, and I know, I, I, I saw, uh, I remember your face when I say, when I told you that I went in with my laptop. So yes. now, now that I'm out, right? Now that I'm out, uh, I know when to switch on the laptop and when to switch off the laptop. Well, that's, I know that's when really to, That is, for me, that is like, wow, because at this time, I would be still sitting on my laptop right now. But I see, switched it off. 
I switched it off a long time ago. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very proud of you for that. And <laughs> I think also it's very easy. And I think that I can point to that trap as well, where if you're going through some difficulty, and especially some emotional difficulty, it's very easy to drown yourself in work or sort of yeah. to do something that, or just to keep yourself busy. So that you yeah. don't have to deal with whatever you're going through. So like you say, like sadness or, you know, or trauma and loss, um, mm. you know, sometimes it's a coping mechanism, but it also mm -hmm. comes with its own consequences. Yeah. You know, and yeah. You, don't, you don't always realize that. One thing, one thing that I forgot to mention is that, um, so with, with depression, right, you can, easily develop an eating disorder. So okay. it's either you eat a lot or you eat less mm -hmm. or you eat the wrong kind of food. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I was beginning to eat less, right? Oh, because wow. I'm keeping myself occupied with work. And I had, I had lost quite a bit of weight and I was comfortable with it. You know, I had lost mm -hmm. quite a bit of weight and I was fine with it. I saw nothing wrong with it. I was exercising, taking my walks and everything else. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I went to the clinic now, they would give you medication like the vitamin tablets to, to boost your immune, to keep you healthy, to sort of recover from where you were at before you got into the facility. And mm -hmm. I, I again started eating a balanced diet, right? And that was like, wow. I was always hungry when I was in the facility and I actually picked on quite a bit of weight. Uh, when I came out, I got home, I'm trying to put on my, my clothes, my usual pants. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, this is what happened. So it became like reality to me. So it is also very, very important. I mean, there is medication like the antidepressants, these, the anti-anxiety tablets, etc. I don't know them by name, but there are a few things that you can do to get yourself back into shape, to get yourself back into a normal sort of state, you know, or to be able to cope living each day. And one of the most important things is to make sure that uh, you eat a balanced diet. And if you are lacking appetite, maybe eat small snacks in between as you go. And that's one, of, one good thing. I love food or I, I, I got back my love for food after that. So I now enjoy eating. I enjoy making meals for myself. I enjoy cooking. It's really cool. So you even went as far as sort of not enjoying your food. Yeah. So that is where it got to. I would probably on some days, I remember on some days I'd be like, I want to have a, a proper meal, right? And I would make food. By the time I'm done cooking, I'm like, okay, I'll have it tomorrow. I just don't have the appetite in them. I don't feel like having much of the food. I might just nibble a little bit and leave it. I go to work the next morning, um, nibble on junk or whatever that I'm eating during the course of the day. And by the mm -hmm. time I get home, I'll probably not eat the same food, you know, or I would have probably had mm -hmm. something along the way, either at the office or whatever. But I would, it, 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 it had really gone down in terms of, me really enjoying a nice warm meal at home. Um, mm -hmm. I did try. I did try to be a bit healthy, having some smoothies, hoping that it mm -hmm. would cover up and help a little bit along the way. But it's not the same. It's not the same. So one of the signs also is then seeing that not enjoying the things you previously used to enjoy. Yeah, that's, that's really... That was really top of the list for me. Um, mm -hmm. It was really top of the list for me. Uh, I used to do the radio show since about quite some time back, since probably 2016. Um, oh. I had slowly stopped. I had slowly stopped. Uh, I justified why I had stopped. Um, and I started to just live on that lie. And I was justified and I just didn't enjoy doing it anymore. Actually, I didn't enjoy it. Um, then came teaching children's church and Sunday school at church. I had slowly lost the love for it. You know, even when I started doing it, I was like, okay, let me just do it. 
you know, and mm -hmm. let's pass time, you know. But there was no longer the passion in there anymore than like what I had before, you know, hanging mm -hmm. out with friends. If friends would probably call me and say, hey, Edgar, we're going out to this place. Would you like to come? And I would obviously have a reason to tell them no. Uh, and it would be very valid, according to me, that I'm not attending that event, mm -hmm. whether it's a wedding or it's a party, it's a bride or whatever. Um, I would not be interested in in in, uh, in going there um so mm -hmm. the other thing was for me it, it it happened the opposite way so another sign of depression is either you sleep less or you sleep a lot mm -hmm. so there are some that are comfortable with spending the whole day in bed right mm -hmm. i didn't do that i'll spend most of the time out of bed and now I enjoy slipping in. If it's a Saturday, I'm not going to work. I'm not doing anything. I spend my time in bed. I'm, I, I sleep and I lay in bed till 9, 10, 11. Then I get up and I get on with my day. Uh, I have a proper sleeping routine now, you know? And it's, 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 it's a different life. You have to sort of embrace what you learn in the clinic. And there's really nothing wrong. I know there is a lot of sort of stigma around it. If I'm to say to someone, I went to uh, a mental facility or I went to, to the clinic for, uh, for, for treatment of this condition, the story is like, what? You went to a psych ward. So people would start mm -hmm. to think that you have gone to a mental facility where there are people that are banging their heads on the wall and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things. That's not what it is. They, it's a different mm -hmm. place with that mm -hmm. you know it's it's a i don't know how to define it but where i went to it wasn't at all like that you know so that's where it's it, it becomes a bit difficult even for someone uh just back in backtracking a bit that's why people really shy away from opening up about their issues opening up about having gone through depression or even going through depression as an illness because they are more worried about what is people going to say? What are people going to whisper in the corridors about me? Be it in the workplace environment or be mm. it in the social place environment. People are going to be like, oh, this guy went to a, a mental clinic or a mental facility. Uh, be careful with him. They will start treating you different, you know. So that is there. And that's what probably hinders people from opening up about their lives and what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Rates of suicide are continuing to, to sort of go up, you know, in and about, um, I think it must have been about 2017 or something like that. I read about it some time back, like about a total of about 8,000 suicides, you know, and it's all, I'm sure it's because someone has failed to, to get help or mm -hmm. the door has not been opened for them to be able to open up and say, hey, guys, look, I actually need help, you know? So is that mm -hmm. just that stigma? And it could be a stigma because of how we were raised, cultural issues and societal pressures that cause us not to open up uh, to ask for help. Okay, so there's quite a few, like you're talking, there was quite a few questions that came to mind. Um, so, right. you know, you're talking about the mental people like having this image of a mental facility, but I just want to be clear. So you, you went to a, was it specifically a de depression clinic? Yes, it was, it's a clinic that specializes in depression and anxiety. Uh, it also treats people for substance abuse or substance abuse, mm -hmm. that is drugs and alcohol, etc. Uh, that it, it, that's what it is uh, specific to, is, is a facility, yeah. Okay. And then tell me with that, like, can you tell us, um, like, can you talk us through, like, what the process is? So how do you get to go, go there? Do you need right. to be referred? Uh, what sort of things can you take with? Can you, can you just give us some sort of yeah. picture of so what that's, that was like? That's a very good question, Lubna. I like that one. So there, there are two ways that you can do it. Firstly, it is to acknowledge you need help, right? So that's, we, we've worked on that already. 
And the next thing mm -hmm. is, if you've got medical aid, depending on the structure of your medical aid, you are able, you've got a limit under what is called mental illness or mental health benefit. Mm -hmm. It's usually a rand amount, uh, which, will be, which will be allocated to 21 days in hospital, or you can convert those 21 days to a set number of visits to a psychologist. It just depends on your plan type, the medical scheme that you're with. All of the medical schemes, they do, actually do offer uh, a mental health benefit. It's just the amount or the extent of cover that they will give you. So depending well, on how... how mm, Yes. So depending on, the, again, the structure of your option, you may require a referral from your treating GP. So your treating GP will take you through a process uh, of asking you a certain set of questions. Depending on how you score on that, they're most probably able to uh, determine and diagnose that, look, you may be depressed um, mm -hmm. and you do need to go for uh, for, for evaluation or you need to go and, 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 and be booked in into, uh, into a clinic. So they will do a referral letter for you depending on the facilities that are within your network and according to your plan type, then you will be admitted for, for the 21 days in hospital or in the, the facility. The other route, which is what I took myself, was to uh, sort of not necessarily go through the going to see a GP and then go to the facility. Um, I went straight to the place. I first went to one facility and they said, no, uh, you need to go to another one. So they referred me to the other facility, which is where I then checked in. And the check-in process is, is, is quite interesting. There's a certain set of questions that they ask you to be able to determine which area or which sort of class to put you in so that they give you the necessary treatment that is specific to your condition and the reason why you are checking into the into the clinic so firstly you can't uh so i was given uh i think a day before i went in they send me a list of things to bring in and things not to bring in so you can't bring in anything with the drawstring uh, you can't bring anything that has got like shoelaces. You can't go in with shoelaces. You can't go in with uh, with any bottle whatsoever. So it could be your your deodorant, your perfume, or your roll on, whatever it could be. You can't go with mm -hmm. it. You can't go mm -hmm. with anything that is sharp. You know. So the it's 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 uh it, it's obviously all to do with risk management. I'm sure it's a risk mitigating sort of exercise to ensure that maybe you don't cut yourself uh, or you don't hang yourself or you don't mm -hmm. use that particular instrument to harm others mm -hmm. or others may not take it from you and harm themselves using it. I see. So okay. if, yeah. So even when it comes, if you were taking medication before you came to the facility, uh, it has to be prescribed med medication. Uh, you don't keep it with you. It is kept somewhere else, and you need to request for it when you need to take it. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's all really, it's not like to make you feel like you're in a prison or in mm -hmm. a penitentiary, mm -hmm. but it is to also protect you and to protect others at the same time. Mm. Yeah. It makes that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I wouldn't have known that that's what they do. So, um, and, 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 okay. Good and, and and you said those are the lists of things not to take. What what yes? What can you take in? So things that you can take in is like shoes without laces. Uh, maybe a book. You can still you can still go in with your phone, uh, even though they try and discourage you from coming to to for group therapy and the classes with your phone, so that you can at least focus. You see, yeah. And, uh, and again, for privacy as well, you cannot really be taking pictures within the facility, even oh. selfies. You can't do selfies in the oh, facility. No. Yeah, so that is also prohibited. Uh, maybe at the time that I went in, it was still during the pandemic as well, so you couldn't get visitors. But if you say you request for someone to bring you some snacks, Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the snacks are left down at the uh, at the reception. 
Uh, they will obviously search it before they give it to you. I mean, to look out for any illegal yeah. substances, any drug paraphernalia or any sort uh, before they hand it to you. So it's, 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 it's not a prison, like I'm saying. It's not a prison, um, mm. but it is to actually help you. For me, the two weeks that I was there, right, I really, for the first time in a very long time, I enjoyed my sleep, even though wow. it was medically induced, though, but I did enjoy my sleep. I then learned right there that it is important to sleep. Remember when we were still babies, uh, we were sent to bed at eight o'clock and we would think it's punishment. You know, mm -hmm. it's not punishment. Actually, yeah. it is for your own good. And for me, when I slept the, the first two, three days, right through, like, we'll go to bed around about nine, half past nine. Uh, in the first days, the meds was quite a bit heavy on me. So by the time it's eight o'clock, I'm still out for the count. Um, the nurses will come in to take your vitals, your blood pressure, everything else. Um, and I would wake up later and probably not have a clue about who was there who was in the room, I just know that someone did come in because they changed this and they changed that in the room. Um, mm. But it was for my own good. It was really for my own good. A friend of mine who went through a similar situation, I interviewed him on my radio show some time ago. Uh, mm -hmm. He said on that show, he said to me, Edgar, the best way that you can... Uh, make it worthwhile when you go to rehab or when you are checked into a clinic is to work the program. Be dedicated to the program. Be committed to the program. Do everything that you are being asked to do because it's not like there is uh, a, a prison warden who is waiting to jack you up or who's waiting to beat you up if you don't do a certain thing. It's all about really trying to help you uh, that support system is what they are giving you. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense. So, Ike, we've got 15 minutes left. Um, sure. So, the time's going really quickly. Really? I think we'll do it <laughs> really quickly. I think what I would like to um, focus on, you've touched on it a little bit, uh, but what I want to like um, chat about is how can we support people that are going through depression. What are the some of, and what is support structure? What is a good support structure look like? Okay, so let me let me answer that in sort of two parts, right? And I'm and everything that I'm speaking from it's one uh, ninety percent to ninety five percent from a personal experience, and five percent it is also from then doing a little bit of more research about the condition and how I, I, I can I, I can. Um, accustomed to it and be better person. So the most important mm -hmm. thing, if you are talking, if you identify that your loved one, your friend, or whoever the person it is that you know is going through this sort of condition, uh, the first thing that you need to do is to f assist that person to find out what mental, what is the mental illness that they have got, and you then help them to get the treatment. So. It's either go with that loved person, with your loved one, to the clinic, to the doctor, to the counselor, to find out what is wrong. And secondly, support groups. They really help as well. Uh, and even for yourself, now that you know that, okay, I've got this particular condition, learn about the mental health illness that you've got. Study a little bit more. Do quite a bit of research around the, that condition of depression, which is what I then did. Um, and I mentioned it earlier on about listening and supporting the person that is opening up to you. So if a person mm -hmm. comes and opens up to you, Lubna, be the person mm -hmm. that will listen. Most of the time, a person that comes to talk to you about their issue, it's not because they're always looking for an opinion. Sometimes they just want someone to listen. They don't want you to respond. They don't want you to pass judgment. They don't want you to give your opinion around what they are saying. They just want to empty it out. They want to just let it out. They want to cry and just be there for them. That's what they're looking for, you know? 
And around uh, finding a good support structure, that's very important. Have, have a group of friends that you trust. It doesn't have to be a large group. In my opinion, it doesn't have to be more than three or more than five people. I mean, have one, two, three people that will speak into your life, two, three people that will give you advice and listen to you and actually not to push you, but to encourage you to do what you're supposed to do. So these are people that you can open up to and say, hey, you know what, dude, today I'm not having a good day. Today, I just, want to, I just want to chill at home, you know? But when someone says that to you, don't treat them like children now. Don't treat them like a child. Don't force the depressed person to cheer up because it is, I, they've got real feelings. They've got real feelings. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you can snap out of it. You can't just immediately feel better. It's not like mm -hmm. you're just going to inject a drug into me and immediately I'm smiling, chappy, happy, and all of that, you know? Mm. So that's why it's important that it's not only me who has the condition or who went through the depression and anxiety issue who has to know about the condition. But I think yeah. what is important is whether you have been, whether you have encountered a loved one with that condition or mm. maybe not encountered, it is good to know about it so that you know how to handle them or how to treat them should it happen. So I think it's, it, it's really for everyone to do it. It's not about even your loved one. It's about even a work colleague, you know? Mm. It's a colleague at work. There are times, I mean, it just so happened for me that it was not everyone that could see that something is not right with this guy. You know, mm -hmm. we leave the office, we leave him in the office, we get to the office the next morning, he's there, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've got a, one colleague of mine uh, that would always say, why don't you just have a bed in the office, Edgar, because you're always mm -hmm. here, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really uh, a joke that we would always have. Mm -hmm. But it's just that we do not know the telltale signs of certain conditions about the, the uh, about depression or about anxiety. So mm -hmm. your support structure, it may not only be your family, but it is also important to have family supporting you because once your family turns you away, where else mm -hmm. can you turn to? You know what I mean? Yes. You need your family to be the ones that support you the most before your high school friend or before your buddy from school or before your hangout buddy uh, is there for you. Your family should be there for you to understand you, to say, okay, our sister is going through this. Our brother is going through this. And it's really across the board. Mm, I see. So it's I see. important. Um, it's very important. And um so I want to sort of, sort of come back and you're saying that sometimes, you know, what, what, what you needed is just for somebody to listen, right? And to like lean the shoulder and to just be able to cry. Um, yeah. And I think I'm definitely like that where if somebody comes to me with problems, like, okay, this is what you need to do. You know, yeah. you need to do A, B, B, and C. And I, and I am slowly starting to realize that, you know, it's, that's not, you know, you know, people don't necessarily come to ask for a solution. They just want to be heard. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, 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 I find it awkward to, like, listen to it, to not say anything. So mm. how, like you were saying, that sometimes I just want to, so what sort of things can people say, you know, to, to make you feel like you are being listened to and heard, um, you know, so for me, for me, it starts off with saying, um, I understand what you're going through. It's to probably say, uh, I, I know how it feels or I know how you're feeling right now. And then mm -hmm. you pick the right words in there. Or you probably ask them an open-ended question to say, how does that make you feel? Uh, mm -hmm. How would you like to go about it? How would you like to see things different? without bashing them with an opinion. For me, like I'm saying, 
I'm, I can only share from my own experience. I would have people that I would go talk to about it and try to tell them about my situation. I'm just mm -hmm. wanting you to listen here today, you know, not to give me an opinion. That would really aggravate me. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would send me in a total mood. That whole conversation mm -hmm. will go south very, very quickly, you know, because I'm done being judged, remember? And then uh, I'm coming to you for your support. You put mm -hmm. more judgment on top of that. And all I'm just looking for is for you to say, I understand how you feel, Edgar. I understand how you feel, Lubna, you know? That's what I'm looking for. Not to then say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the moment that would happen to me, that's the end of the, the nice conversation on there. And it will just send me into an extreme angry mode. You know, that was what it was. And then that would make me shut out again. Just because of that. Because I'm feeling like, who's going to listen to me? Must I go talk to this guy? Must I talk to, to, to this person? They're going to judge me again. They're going to say all of these things and upset me even more. And by so doing, it would slowly slump me, slump me, and slump me into a deeper depression. Okay. So that, that was, thank you for that. I think that, I think yeah. a lot of people can learn from a response like that. Echo, so. we've got five minutes left. left. Um, and right. I see there are a few people on, on the chat. So if you have any questions, please don't be shy to ask and we'll see if we can address them. But I want to slowly um, wind down now. So it could mm -hmm. tell me, um, Lars, what, what, what kind of message would you like to leave um, the listeners with? Or what kind of, firstly, and for people in general, and what kind of message would you like to leave with someone that might actually be listening to you and saying, I ex yeah. I'm experiencing the same things, or I know I'm actually depressed. Um, what so, would you like to leave them with? So firstly, I'd want to say to the person that is probably in that state, in that depressed sort of condition and who can relate to everything that I've spoken about, everything that mm -hmm. we've talked about now. And I want to say to them, uh, it's a cliche though, it says that it's okay not to be okay. That's mm -hmm. first and foremost. It's okay not to be okay. And it's a sign of strength to ask for help. It's a sign of strength mm -hmm. to open up to someone and say, look, today I'm feeling down, I'm feeling weak. You know, it's a sign of strength to ask for help. I would have been six feet under if I had not said I'm asking for help. And I did ask for the help. And today I'm standing on my two feet strong enough to be able to say to someone, it's okay not to be okay. You don't have to be shy about it. Find someone that you can really trust that can walk you through that journey to a place mm -hmm. where you will achieve total wellness, you can be mm -hmm. completely sorted out of depression without medication. And sometimes you may need medication and treatment, etc. It just depends on who you are or uh, what your treating doctor has advised you to do. Mm -hmm. So the message that is out there is even to, to the men, to the males out there, it's okay to cry. It's okay to ask for help. Just find the right person to ask the help from. It's not everyone that's going to help you. Let me be sure about that with everybody. It's not everybody that is going to open up their heart to you and say, listen, buddy, I'm here for you. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's not everyone that's going to do that. And it's not everyone that is going to look at you with straight eyes and not judge you. That will mm -hmm. happen. So if you are in that situation, I hope you have listened. And if you're not in that situation, be that support person, be the support pillar to a friend, to a, to a brother, to a sister, to a colleague, even at work, to be able to identify that this friend of mine needs some help. Learn about it. And I'm sure it will change a life. Okay, that is, that is great advice um, to be leaving people with. 
And I can tell you Thank that you. I, I, I personally know quite a few people that have gone through depression. Um, and I think that it's a lot more common than people actually realize. And yeah. so I think I read somewhere um, that they say that depression is like, is as common as a cold in yep. terms of mental health illnesses. Not, not in terms of severity, not in terms of like a cold is not as severe, but you know, depression can be severe, but in the sense that it's something that quite a few people go through or can go yep. through. So, so Ika, I'd like to say thank you so much for, thank you. for being brave to come <laughs> on this now chat um, and also for challenging the men out there as well, for actually speaking up for me and for telling them that, you know, that it's okay to cry. I think that that's a big mm. one. And you've definitely opened my eyes to, you know, some of the challenge challenges that men face, you know, so. because yes, um, it's very easy for women. It's a, it's a lot easier. A society is a lot more forgiving and a lot more uh, encouraging to women to talk about mental health and um, how they're doing, but for men, it's it's not necessarily the same. And uh, I think that you really should light to that as well, which is which is yeah. great. So thank you, thank you for that, it's and pleasure. thank you for for you know being willing to share your story and to um, want to also help other people. Thank you, Lulubna. Thank you for having me to such. A great pleasure. And should anyone maybe want to uh, mm -hmm. chat to me outside of this platform or they want to reach out to me, you're welcome to do it through Lubna. Uh, just reach out. Yes, yes, they can contact you and then she, she will put you in touch with me. I'm not a psychologist. Mm -hmm. Like I say to you, I will only share with you my experiences um, mm -hmm. and give you the necessary tools that I've learned from experience um, and you will take it from there. Thank you, Lubna. Definitely, I, I'm I'm happy to to put to, to put people in touch with you if they if they want to. Um, I'll do that with pleasure. But thank you okay. so much again, and thank you to the people that have joined the call. Um, yeah. I, I think it was it was a a, a sensitive topic, but I think. Um, I'm, I'm very glad with how it went. So thank you so much for this. Thank you, Lubna. Have yourself a good evening. We'll chat again soon. Thank you. I'm actually going to go eat now, and I hope you also get to have something to eat. <laughs> I've done that already, remember? I've had myself already in an hour and a half time. I'll be okay. off to bed. Long as you're eating. <laughs> 100%. Thank you, Lubna. Bye for now. Thank and thank you, Pire, for joining the call as well. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for joining, and I hope you learned something too.